Hi folks, Dr. Matt Moynihan here talking about the Polywell. I wanted to do a special edition about the Polywell because I know there's a lot of interest in the concept right now. And I spent about seven years looking at this. And so I want to make sure that th that information gets out the door so we don't repeat the same mistakes of the past. So after seven years of looking at this, I've come to the conclusion that the Polywell will not work as a fusion approach. And I want to make that very clear. And I want to explain why it won't work. So a little history, the Polywell was invented in the 1980s by Robert Broussard, who was a physicist from Princeton. And he created a company called EMC2. Um, they submitted for Navy funding and were ultimately funded somewhere on the order of 40 plus million dollars from the late 80s to um, the early 2000s. And so they conducted a lot of experiments and they published about, you know, two or three dozen papers on the Polywell system and modeling. Um, he worked very closely with Nick Krull, who was a theoretician who's still alive in San Diego. He's probably in his late 90s now. Um, but Broussard and Krull and his wife and then a whole slew of people that worked for EMC2 developed the Polywell. And for about 11 years, they were under a gag order from the Navy, so they weren't allowed to talk about any of the work that they were doing. Um, and then he went public uh, in, with uh, a paper in an international astronomical uh, journal, and he gave a talk at Google uh, right before he passed away. And then EMC2 was led by Rick Niebel, and then later Jay Young Park, who... Uh, did some of the best work on the Polywell to date, and he published a, a great paper in 2014. Since then, um, a number of smaller companies have pursued it, Joel Rogers and Progressive Fusion Solutions in Vancouver. There was also a company called Convergence Scientific Incorporated that I was involved in that developed, we spent about seven years, seven or eight years working on the Polywell uh, in Bellingham, Washington. And there was, there's also an academic team under Joe Kashin at the University of Sydney. And uh, out of the University of Sydney, there was a group called Fusion One, which pursued the Polywell from 2014 to 2016 or so under Randall Volberg and um, Matt Carr. So a whole bunch of different efforts that I just went over there. Also, the Polywell is closely related to the Lockheed Martin approach the compact fusion reactor. And so Lockheed has a lot more uh, tools and diagnostics and modeling tools. So a lot of their results sort of inform the Polywell work. But the bottom line is after all of that work and, and reading all those papers and everything else, the Polywell is not going to work. And I wanna talk about why. So the first tenant of the Polywell is the heating mechanism. The Polywell relies on the idea that you can concentrate negative charge in a plasma in one place, and that will create a voltage drop which will suck in ions, accelerate them and get them to collide and fuse. And this is a problem. Um, if you take plasma 101 in college, one of the first things you learn is the quasi-neutral assumption, which is an assumption that generally states that in a block of plasma, a given block of plasma, the positives and negatives are relatively well mixed together. And this makes sense because positives and negatives attract each other. And so when you think about a plasma, just a stagnant, quiescent, normal plasma that doesn't have anything going on with it, it's a, a soup of positive and negative charge with this force web between them all positives and negatives, you know, having a force system between them. So they're all kind of dispersed. And that's what a plasma is. Now there are there are exceptions to this, of course. Like for instance, in a structured plasma, there you get a current going, like a like a river of negative charge, and you can get that going in a loop, and that current will create a magnetic field 90 degrees to it, and so that will stabilize. And you can structure plasma. You can whip up smoke rings and sheets and all sorts of exotic objects. Now, of course, they're unstable they don't last forever and so there's a whole slew of companies that are trying to build fusion reactors around this idea and every one of them has some trick where they're trying to stabilize their plasma they're trying to do something to make their structure stable but further out 
um, where you have more and more of one charge instead of another, um, you get major problems. And this is a fundamental problem with the Polywell's heating mechanism. Concentrating negative charge doesn't work over long periods of time. The, the electrostatic voltages that build up between positives and negatives start to rip the plasma apart. Um, this can be called tearing modes. This can be called chaotic behavior, uh, a whole variety of things. I mean, even if you if you charge up enough negative charge, um, you'll start pulling in positives from the metal itself. So you can get like lightning bolts, for instance. Um, all these things disrupt this negative plasma that you're trying to create in the center of your poly well. So the long and the short of it is the heating mechanism doesn't work the way that supporters want it to work. Now, I want to clarify. Um, supporters of the Polywell will say that, hey, we, we made 8,000 volts uh, in 1994-95 at EMC2. And there is a paper that does show that they made a potential well of 8,000 volts. They made one of, I think it was, don't quote me on this, but I think it was 6,000, 4,000, and 8,000 volt potential wells. Now, the way they did this was they pumped in copious amounts of electrons, and then they they took a you know a reading of the voltage over a short period of time after they did that. Uh, and Nick Kroll wrote the paper, and he'll argue that you can get a negative potential well. So it's not a stable thing, first of all. It's very temporary. And then, so to make it work, you have to be pumping in electrons through electron beams. And that's not really feasible. It's cumbersome. And the other issue is that pumping these electrons gets in the way of the second fundamental tenet of the polywell, which is this cusp confinement, uh, confining, trapping mechanism that the polywell is relying on. So let's talk about the other tenet. The other tenet of this system is cusp confinement. So what is a cusp? A cusp is when you have two electromagnets that are the same pole, so north and north or south and south, facing one another. And when they face one another, their fields reject one another. So their fields kind of sweep out in a sharply bent field. Hopefully I'm showing a picture of that now. Now in the center of that field, there is a, a pocket where there is no magnetic field. It's right in the middle between both magnets. There's a point where the field is zero. Okay, it's called the null point. And the simplest, this is the simplest cusp system. It's two magnets looking, uh, facing one another, north and north. Now, the magnets could be bar magnets, or in the case of the polywell, there are electromagnets shaped like donuts. So the polywell itself is six donuts in a box basically, the most basic form of the polywell. There are other variations where you have more magnets and um, there's even more uh, options, design options around that space. But the basic polywell is six magnets in a box, six donuts that face one another, six magnet, magnetic fields that face one another, six north poles that face inward, for example. Now, in that case, um, there's, an, there's an electromagnetic force in play because these magnets do not like each other. Anyone that's tried to put two bar magnets facing one another, a north and a north, understands that the magnets do not like this and they want to flip around. And in the case of the polywell, this means that there's going to be forces on the rings and consequently the entire reactor superstructure. And those forces actually put a limit on how high you can scale up this magnetic field. So if you, if you ramp up these magnetic fields, and, and polywells could be built with all superconducting magnets. They could go up to, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 Tesla fields. But again, as you do this, the polywell, unlike most fusion approaches, has this fundamental flaw where as you scale up in, in field, the force gets so high that it could start to rip the, the, the system apart and actually damage the superstructure of the reactor itself. So that's an issue. But in any case, in a cusp confinement system, what happens is you inject plasma and that plasma 
moves along the field lines, the curved field lines back and forth, and is scattered um, down towards the center, towards the middle of the box. So it's down scattered. It, in, this happens in tokamaks and, and accelerators as well. Whenever a plasma is moving along a curved field, if two plasma ions bump into each other, they get knocked to the outside field. They go to the lower energy. And this is a problem in stellarators and tokamaks because if you get knocked enough, you end up hitting the wall and you become a problem. But in the, in the cusp system, it's actually a good thing because it scatters towards the center. It scatters into the middle. But that's not the whole story. So in cusp systems, that's sort of the first the first phase where you inject material, it moves along the field lines, it scatters towards the center, it kind of piles up in the center. The second concept is that the plasma is diamagnetic. So what does that mean? It means that the plasma has its own magnetic properties. Um, a, diamagne a diamagnetic material um, would reject or degrade a magnetic field applied to it. So an example might be zinc. Um, the bl a block of zinc has its own magnetic properties such that it would reject the outside applied field. Okay. So in the Polywell's case, the supporters are assuming that plasma is going to create its own magnetic field so much that it would reject the outside field created by those six rings. And in the rejection, it in increases, it swells up almost like a balloon. It swells up a pocket in the center of those fields where you can contain plasma. Now, there is some theory supporting this. Um, Dr. Harold Grad in the 1950s and 60s modeled cus systems. Him and Jim Tuck were two theoreticians who looked at cus systems independently. Uh, Grad modeled this using some Fortran computers, and he sort of tracked the way particles behave. He there was like a there was a region where they would spiral in towards the cusps, and then they would sort of move straight in the center region where there was no field. So Harold Grad decided that there was an adiabatic and non-adiabatic region. That's what he ended up calling it. He said there's, a, there's a, an area where these particles are going to move straight because they're non-magnetized, because the field has been pushed back, or there is an area along the cusps where they spiral along. Okay, And years and years and years, and years later, the University of Sydney reached back and used that model to justify um, their entire Polywell simulation. They, they, they simulated six rings in a box and simulated what the particles would do and said that there was an adiabatic and non-adiabatic region. Okay. So if you're following along, um, the mechanism here is inject material, get it to scatter in the center, get the plasma to build up a diamagnetic property sufficient enough that it pushes back the outside field and pinches off the cusp points where it, it leaks. Now, I'm highly skeptical thus far that what I just described is really going to happen in real life. Um, plasma generally is not diamagnetic. Um, as a general rule, when you apply a magnetic field to a plasma, Mostly what happens usually is the, the plasma becomes magnetized. The magnetic field goes straight through and the plasma is um, dominated by that magnetic field. And it, it uh, behaves and reacts driven by that magnetic field, not by its own internal magnetic field. Now, of course, there are, there are examples where a plasma can generate its own field when you are structuring plasma, that that structure, when you build a structure out of plasma, see the FRC chapter and whatever else, um, that, cr that creates its own structure and that creates its own magnetic field. But the concept that a stagnant plasma, not moving, not doing anything, is going to reject the outside field is very difficult for me to, gr to accept. Now, you can argue maybe theoretically that 
you could put a ton of plasma in there and drive the density way up. And hey, at this high density, you get this awesome behavior that we love. Okay. So this is this is a stretch, this is a stretch claim. But okay, so we've gone over two fun formation steps: injection of material and scattering to form a pocket, and then swelling of that pocket to form uh, because of diamagnetism properties. Now let's go to the third phase of formation. And this is where the, the, the pocket has grown so large that it starts to pinch off the magnetic cusps, creating, so shrinking the holes on the edges of that trap. And Bussard had a term for this. He called it the wiffle ball effect. And he was he was describing a kid's toy. Uh, if you ever played baseball, there's a wiffle ball, which is a is a ball with it's a hollow sphere with holes in it, and that's the way he described this effect. He said that there's a wiffle ball effect where the plasma is basically internally trapped, except along these these cusp points, and I hopefully I'm showing a picture of that, where on the cusp points material can leak through. Okay. And so he, he claims this. And so now there is, there are papers. Thomas Dolan did a nice review of this in the nineties. And he, he tried to assemble theoretical ideas about if this really did happen, how thick is the skin of the cusp? How big are the holes where the material leaks out? What are the sizes of them? And he's got some equations for that. And then, you know, what's the general characteristics of this? Now, on top of that, there's a gentleman named Joel Rogers who uh, filed a patent and wrote a couple papers. He worked for a company called Progressive Fusion Solutions. Joel has said that on the surface of this cusp or this, this kind of trap, there is a surface current. Essentially, the plasma forms a current sheath of uh electrons and there's a there's a term there's a roseman i i forget the exact term so like a Farrell chapman roseau sheath which is an astrophysical effect where plasma in astrophysical bodies will form sheets of current electric current on the surface of things and so they're claiming that in this system this cusp whisk wiffle ball effect system there's a current that forms on the edge of the plasma trap. And that enhances the trap, improves the pressure, and makes the thing work better or make it more robust. Now, Rogers has a paper on it, and there is also um, some modeling work from Lockheed Martin that shows that effect, um, which hopefully I'm showing a picture of. This this modeling work came, this is this image that you're looking at came out in 2016, and it was from a uh, two-dimensional code that Lockheed Martin ran where they basically modeled the XY plane and then spun it around an axis like a uh, they sp spun it around an axis so this has a lot of the effects that I've been describing so so far in the simulation it has a surface current as you'll see there it has a, a, a zone of no magnetic field in the center which which uh, Grad called an uh, adiabatic or non-adiabatic region, where the material, the plasma is non-magnetized, so the outside field doesn't penetrate in there, and the particles can move generally straight, in straight lines. And then it has a high magnetic field on the outside, and then it has cusp systems on the edge. So Lockheed did this simulation, actually, I should correct myself. Lockheed didn't do the simulation. Lockheed subcontracted this to somebody else and they did the simulation. But anyway, they, they presented this in the, in a 2016 poster at the APS meeting that exhibits some of the behaviors of a cuss trap. So Bassard is claiming that this is all going to work like this. And we don't have data that really shows that this works, okay? Lockheed Martin may have some data and um, they've done a number of posters and presentations and talks, but they've never published in a paper in a journal article, okay? And some of the, some of the results that I've seen from their talks have indicated that 
they did this, but the 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 temperature of the plasma was very low. I'm talking like tens of tens of EVs, you know, not even a K, not even a thousand electron volts, or let alone ten thousand electron volts, which is the temperature you might need for fusion. Their electron temperatures are very, very, very cold. Um, and certainly EMC two never published a peer reviewed paper where they show this trap. Um, robustly and regularly and um, effectively, okay? So this mechanism that we've been describing here is all theory and simulations. There's not a lot of real data backing it up. And that's one of the reasons why I don't think the polywell is going to work. Now, now I say that, I say that, but in the next five years, if somebody came forward and put out papers that said, hey, we built this thing, we turned it on, we got this data, we measured this hard and fast information that proves out this effect in, in, in fact is happening, then I might change my tune, you know, <laughs> you know, never say never. But right now we've got a mechanism that's based on theory and simulations and not on hard facts and not on hard data. And that makes this, this this approach much, 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 much higher risk than another approach like a Stellarator, a Mirror, a Pinch, a Tokamak, where we've got multiple, you know, dozens and dozens and dozens of machines with hard measurements for experimental results going back decades done by multiple, multiple universities, academia, teams, companies, whatever. Okay, so the Polywell... Everything we think we know about the polywell is based on a much narrower set, set of information and data, okay? A much smaller, limited set of information and data, which is why I'm so skeptical that this is going to work, okay? Now, there is a great paper from 2014 where EMC2 measured something like a diamagnetic effect, okay? Okay. I want to review that paper now. After Broussard died, the company EMC2 went to Rick Niebel. And he ran it for about a year and then stepped aside. And then Jay Young Park came in. Jay Young Park was a Los Alamos scientist who had worked at Los Alamos for about, uh, I, th I want to say, 15 years. Don't hold me to that. Something like that. He was a pretty good scientist. And he came in. And he built a updated, um, more complete and robust version of the Polywell um, with externally mounted magnets. Uh, you'll, uh, hopefully, I'm showing a picture of this. The magnets were they were mounted to braces externally, so there was no metal between the rings, and that's an interesting design change, which had a lot of uh, importance because, in if you model this plasma, you'll see that it goes. It goes between the rings and it goes in the center of the rings. And if there's a big hunk of metal between the rings, all the materials slam right into it and it'd be conducted away. The reactor will die because of conduction losses. But anyway, he models this thing. He builds this system. He gets it up and running and he has to pulse it because he doesn't have enough money to get the kind of high voltage continuous power supplies that you need to run this thing permanently. So he's got to pulse the system. Fine. He pulses the system. The other thing he's trying to do is he's trying to measure a diamagnetic effect. And he knows that to get there, he's got to make a really, really dense plasma, like way denser than normal. So he's got to do some cool stuff, some tricks basically to get there. And one of the tricks he does is he develops a plasma cannon um, that vaporizes a sheet of plastic. So in the final experiments, they took a sheet of plastic and put it over an electromagnetic device, and they pass a current over the sheet, and the current heated the sheet of plastic up so that it sublimated and became a hydrocarbon plasma. And the hydro hard hydrocarbon plasmas were pushed into the center of those rings. So... In images from this experiment, from this paper in 2014, what you're looking at is a hydrocarbon plasma, which, of course, is not a fusion plasma because it's the wrong fuel, right? So fusion relies on the fusion of hydrogen. This is hydrocarbon, so it's not the same thing. But anyway, he doesn't care about fusion. His goal is not to prove fusion. His goal is to prove this diamagnetic effect, okay? And... What they did was they, 
they inject the plasma. They have they, well, they they start in a perfect vacuum. They turn on the rings, power up the magnetic field, create the magnetic field. Then they they inject the plasma. The plasma goes into the magnetic fields, and then they shut off the rings. Okay. Now, in the brief time after they shut off the rings, they measure the plasma's diamagnetic properties using something called the flux loop, which is basically a ring of metal that the plasma is passing through that creates a magnetic field, that creates a, 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 a small current that they can measure, okay? And they also detect the X-ray emissions, and they show that there's X-ray emissions and a diamagnetic flux and between the two, the 2014 paper now argues that diamagnetism of a plasma is occurring here. Okay, now that's a pretty robust and solid conclusion, but they take that conclusion and then they make this leap, this leap of logic where, okay, we've got the diamagnetic effect, we've proven it out with this data, therefore, this entire wiffle ball mechanism is valid. And that's a bit of a leap too far for me. Okay. Also, it, it doesn't answer a lot of fundamental questions. How robust is this diamagnetic magnetic trapping effect? How stable is it? Um, is it possible that you could have a, a polywell system create this effect and then maintain it over long periods of time. If you did maintain it and it was stable and robust, how easy is it to inject new material into this system? Okay. These are all open questions that I don't think have very good answers. In fact, it's, it's one could easily argue that once you create the wiffle ball effect, when you try to put more material, more fusion material, more ions into that system, it becomes unstable. Just the act of injecting material into it causes the effect to be screwed up and then it falls apart, okay? So these are all questions that, that don't have clear answers because they haven't really been measured. Lockheed may have measured them, but if they have, they haven't released the data in a public peer-reviewed open journal, okay? So, so we could actually learn a lot if Lockheed would disclose its, its work, but they're not gonna do that. They're not going to do that. Um, I will say that, you know, we, we haven't seen posters and presentations from Lockheed in the last, uh, at the past APS meeting. I think the APS meeting before that and even before that may have not uh, given presentations. That would lead me to believe that Lockheed may have hit a dead, dead end. You know, uh, it certainly from i you know obviously i don't know but from public statements it doesn't seem like that effort is continuing so it's another example of following this fusion approach that's exotic that's really exciting keeping it secret not being open about it and then it leading to a dead end and the world really not benefiting from that work right and now here we are you know all these years later and people want to repeat the same work. And because it wasn't published, because it was kept secret, we repeat the same stupid ideas over and over and over again. And that's one thing I want to avoid here. So, hey, maybe the Lockheed Martin did hit a dead end. I don't know. Maybe they found something really exciting um, that then would make you think that this trap effect would work. I don't know that either. They haven't published in a peer reviewed paper uh, or journal article. Any case, um, so we've gone over a couple of things here. We've, we've talked about, just to review, we've talked about the heating mechanism in a polywell, which is concentrating negative charge, which doesn't, which does not work, probably. And we've talked about the uh, trapping mechanism, which I've presented a theoretical idea for how this trapping mechanism would work, but there's very little data that supports it. Okay, so there's very little information or raw measurements or data that supports that. Just to add to the the the, um, the heating mechanism, um, the University of Sydney also tried to concentrate charge. In fact, they had a uh, they had a PhD thesis named Bowen Reed, who spent an entire thesis on this, and he couldn't get 
any charge concentration. Um, their papers, they have a paper from 2011 that tried to get charge concentration. They couldn't get more than a couple of volts, three, four, three, four, five volts of negative charge concentrated in one place. You need like 10,000 to get fusion. So charge concentration is a dead, a dead end. Now, Lockheed sort of knew that, and they looked at other methods to heat. So it's the same trapping effect as the polywell, but different heating mechanisms. So they patented a magnetic oscillation approach where they try to oscillate the fields to try to squeeze the plasma, heat it up, that sort of thing. Um, they also did neutral beam injection. That, that was in their posters and public releases at APS meetings. So um, neutral beam injection is a pretty standard approach used in tokamak accelerators across fusion. So basically they're trying to combine this exotic cusp trapping system with their neutral beam system to try to make like an exotic trap with a, a normal standard heating approach, as opposed to the polywell, which can't use its electrostatic heating approach. Um, if you can't heat the plasma inside a polywell, the other issue you have is that it's going to cool down. So you've, you've trapped a bunch of material, you've got it in this robust wiffle ball system, you might be getting fusion, but over time, um, radiation losses are going to kill you. The system is constantly bleeding away energy as light, okay, through a variety of mechanisms. And on top of that, the polywell is, it's a system where a magnet is embedded with the plasma, okay? So both the compact fusion reactor by Lockheed and the polywell have that characteristic in common. They have their magnets embedded with the plasma that they're trying to fuse. And so there's a couple characteristics there. One, the magnets have got to be smooth metal. Okay. They've got to be smooth so that they don't build up any charge anywhere and cause arcing. Also, they, they're smooth and conform to the field lines because if you do the modeling, you see that the plasma is flowing around everywhere. And anywhere where there was a sharp uh, joint or anywhere where a metal sticks out into the field becomes a place where plasma slams into it and is conducted away, okay? So both the Lockheed Martin and the Poly will have these smooth ring donuts. But the, the downside of having your magnets physically close to your plasma is that it increases the odds that you you get conduction losses and it just flat out increases the odds that plasma will slam into the metal touch the surface and be conducted away okay so this is why a lot of systems try to put space around their plasma or try to conform their field lines so that none of the field lines ever slam into the wall or a magnet or a diagnostic or a Langmuir probe or any metal anywhere, okay? Polywell and both Lockheed Martin and the Polywell have that issue where the magnets are embedded with the plasma. So, uh, and that's about it. So just to summarize, we've gone over a lot of things. I want to summarize. So one, there's a heating mechanism problem with the polywell, right? Concentrating negative charge. Two, there's a cusp, cusp confinement mechanism that's laid out, but there isn't very much data, robust data from a machine that's been turned on a hundred times and tested that's in a peer reviewed paper that shows that and shows how it behaves, okay? Third issue was if you try to increase the magnetic field on these things, there's a limit to how high you can go because unlike 95% of all fusion approaches, cusp systems have magnets that face one another. And so by going up in field, you have this increasing force on the superstructure, which rips the system apart. Okay. Your, your fourth issue is because your heating mechanism doesn't work, you have to go to some other heating mechanisms. There aren't a lot of good ways to heat cusp system plasma and so over time you've got radiation losses which cause the plasma to cool down so at the end of the day you've got a you're holding a bunch of cold dense plasma in the center that's not fusing okay and then on top of that there's injection issues right if you have that diamagnetic effect you've got that wiffle ball effect happening 
you might have issues injecting. It's not clear that you can inject and not cause the trap to become unstable. Okay. And then on top of all of that, there are also a lot of instabilities that occur whenever you have uh, like a sheet of plasma between an area where there's lots of plasma and vacuum. There's, there's something called the interchange instability. Although supporters will, will say that the polywell is stable against that. And there is a magnetic magnetohydrodynamic theory that says that it's stable against that. So there, it might be stable against instabilities, maybe. But there's enough question marks here in general that I wouldn't choose the polywell as the best horse in the fusion race. There are other horses to bet on. There's mirrors, there's pinches, there's stellarators. There's plenty of machines out there with more robust experimental data sets and more experimental history that you can build off of. Fusion is really hard enough already. You don't want to add all these unknowns on top of that. And I just with the caveat that Lockheed Martin should publish its data just for the benefit of the community. Lockheed Martin should get its data outside in the public, in the open, because that would really go a long way to clarifying this entire branch. You know, if Lockheed spent $60 million or $70 million over 12 years on the CUS system, get it out in the open so that somebody else doesn't have to do that. If it's a dead end, we need to know that. Okay. Be really helpful. All right. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate uh, you taking the time with me and hope this was really helpful. Please leave comments in, in the questions below. I'm going to keep the questions open. I, I'm looking for feedback. I'm trying to make this information really clear and uh, so people can digest it. Okay. Thank you very much. Take care.